the previous lecture, we asked, how big should the government be? The answers we considered, those of Adam Smith, Karl Marx, and John Maynard Keynes, mainly concern the extent to which the government should interfere with the economy and what services it should provide. But things like taxes and industry and financial regulation and education and infrastructure are not all the government does. In fact, when we think of government, what we usually think of is all the ways it restricts our actions, the way it tells us what we can and cannot do. The list is extensive. Murder, theft, slavery, speeding, public nudity, prostitution, selling and using drugs, jaywalking, and in some places, even blasphemy and homosexuality. All are against the law. But how far should this go? Locke argued, remember, that the government should protect our natural right to liberty. But, as he acknowledged, entering the social contract necessarily requires us to give up some of our liberty. So how much should we give up? What kinds of things or actions should be illegal? Since we're concerned with the big questions, let's explore this topic in terms of three big hot button issues. Should or to what extent should marijuana, gay marriage, and offensive and inflammatory speech be legal? And let's look at them by examining what John Stuart Mill would have said about them, specifically what he would have said about them and the limits of liberty in his famous 1859 work on liberty. When Mill wrote on liberty, the tyrannical rule of monarchs had largely ended, particularly in England and in the West. Democracy had taken hold. But that, Mill argued, didn't mean that tyranny was a thing of the past. In a democracy, the majority rules. So if the majority decides to oppress some minority portion of the population, it can do so with impunity because that minority could never overrule them. This Mill called is the threat of the tyranny of the majority, a phrase he borrowed from Alexis de Tocqueville. And we must guard against it, Mill said, just as much as we must guard against the tyranny of monarchs. Now, clearly, Mill didn't trust the majority to the extent that, say, Rousseau did, and rightly so. Such tyranny was already a real problem. Take American slavery, for example, a near-perfect example of the tyranny of the majority, where the white majority found it perfectly acceptable to force the black minority to do all of their dirty work. Mill wrote on liberty while that was still a reality. In fact, the American South seceded and started the Civil War soon after On Liberty's publication. And Mill likely was at least a partial inspiration for Lincoln's convictions against slavery and the need to defeat the South instead of allowing them just to be a separate slaveholding nation. Lincoln was a fan of Mill's work. But even once the South was defeated and the slaves were set free and given the right to vote, the tyranny of the majority continued in the form of segregation and Jim Crow laws. Government-sanctioned tyranny was a real-world problem during Mill's time. But Mill was concerned with more than just government-sanctioned tyranny. He was also concerned with the limits of society's actions, with making clear what should never be done to a minority population, regardless of what the majority wants or what the government does or does not say about it. In fact, Mill was concerned with more than just protecting minority populations like races and groups. Even single individuals need to be protected from the tyranny of the majority. This is why his stated intention of On Liberty was to define the nature and limits of the power which can be legitimately exercised by society over the individual. What could define these limits? Well, recall, Mill was a utilitarian. Thus, he suggested, just like individuals, the government should always act to guarantee the most happiness for the most people. And how can the government do this? Mill argues, by ensuring the liberty of its citizens. Now, to be clear, Mill wasn't arguing that the government should protect liberty because liberty is a natural right. 
as he said, I forgo any advantage which could be derived to my argument from the idea of abstract right as a thing independent of utility, end quote. Liberty should be protected, he argued, because that is the most effective way to ensure the most happiness for the most people. Quote, I regard utility as the ultimate appeal on all ethical questions, end quote. But why is guaranteeing liberty, why is that the best way to ensure the most amount of happiness for the most people? Well, let's think about it. Who best knows what makes you happy? You do, right? Certainly, you know what makes you happy better than the government does. Thus, the best way to ensure the most amount of happiness for the most people is to simply ensure that everyone has the freedom to do what they want, what they think will make them happy. Besides, how can we be happy with restrictions on our liberty? A caged bird doesn't sing, right? But Mill went even further. Restrictions on liberty don't just keep us from doing what makes us happy but from figuring out what makes us happy. They lead to a conformity that doesn't allow for experiments in living or for self-realization, that doesn't let us learn from our mistakes, take responsibility for our actions, and grow as a result. A conformity that overall, Mill argued, doesn't let society progress, flourish, and grow. So for Mill, the utilitarian worth of guaranteeing liberty was the result of its effects on man as a progressive being, that is, all humans together, present and future. Mankind are greater gainers, he says, by suffering each other to live as seems good to themselves than by compelling each other to live as seems good to the rest. Such a protection of individuality is the only way to protect the, quote, source of originality from which we all derive benefits and thus ensure that we all, quote, develop more fully as human beings. But there's an obvious hiccup here. The government can't give everyone the ultimate freedom to do whatever they want and expect to accomplish the greatest overall happiness. Such a government would be indistinguishable from no government at all, from the state of nature. And like Hobbes and Locke, Mill would have agreed that the state of nature was not ideal. Some people are most happy when they're harming others, thus making everyone else miserable. But, Mill argues, the problem reveals the solution. All we need to do is guard against actions that could harm others, and we should be good to go. Nothing else stands in the way of the utilitarian goal. If an action you want to do will not harm anyone else, what possible reason could there be for outlawing it? Of course, people have used superstition, religion, and social taboos to restrict such actions, but, Mill argued, such reasons are nonsense. After all, in a truly secular state, religious taboos cannot be enforced without showing favoritism for a particular religion. And we've seen how well that usually turns out. And so, Mill concludes, the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. Now, it's important to note that this maxim doesn't mean that only harmful actions should be outlawed. It also includes actions that risk harm to others. Speeding down the interstate, for example, doesn't hurt anyone unless you get in an accident, but by then, it's too late. So we don't make getting into an accident illegal. We make speeding illegal, because by doing so, you are risking harm to others. And thus, by doing so, we are preventing harm to others. So the state has the right to outlaw actions that risk harming others. But it does not have the right, says Mel, to prevent a person from risking harm to himself. As long as whatever action you are doing can hurt only you and no one else, then the government should stay out. One notable exception, however, Mill notes, is for minors and the mentally deficient or disabled. The government can keep them from hurting themselves because, Mill says, they don't know any better. Mill is careful to restrict what counts as harm, though. 
you can't just think someone's ugly and say that they harmed you by being in your line of sight. It has to be what Mill calls definite harm, like physical harm, uh, violations of legal rights or theft. It does not include offending your sensibilities or hurting your feelings. Such harms constitute only a minor inconven inconvenience, which, quote, society can afford to bear for the sake of the greater good of human freedom. Now, that's not to say that anything you do, as long as it doesn't harm others, is moral. Legality and morality are different. The fact that something is or should be legal doesn't make it moral, for instance, adultery. The fact that something is or should be illegal doesn't make it immoral, like going five over the speed limit, for example. In fact, one of Mill's main points is that morality should not be used as a basis for law. Even if a particular action leads to more pain than happiness, and thus is immoral on Mill's utilitarian view, as long as it doesn't risk definite harm to others, one should still have the freedom to do it. Of course, if it causes unhappiness because it causes definite harm, well, then it should be illegal. Now, all this talk about the liberty to live as you see fit brings up an interesting question. Recall the reasons we had for thinking that humans lack libertarian free will in the metaphysical sense. Does it make sense to worry, as Mill does, about the government restricting your actions, your freedom, if they aren't, if we aren't really free in the first place? Does it make sense to protect political freedom if we are not, in a metaphysical sense, free? Now, I think it can, since political freedom and medical, metaphysical freedom are two different things, the absence of one does not necessitate the absence of the other. We have to be careful here. Locke, for example, laments violations of liberty because he thinks we have a natural right to liberty. But how can we have a natural right to choose to act as we will if we don't really choose to act as we will, if our genes and environment do that for us? The notion that we have a natural right to liberty appears to be, if not derived from, at least dependent upon the assumption that we are free in a metaphysical sense. So if you are a Lockean, the realization that we are not free in a metaphysical sense may erase your concerns about violations of political liberty. But for the Millian, not so much. Since Mill grounds his defense of liberty in utility, it wouldn't matter whether we are free in the metaphysical sense. Even if metaphysical free will is an illusion, guaranteeing that people can act as they see fit could still produce the most happiness for the most people. And if it does, that's what we should do. At the very least, it's prudentially what we should do if we are concerned with producing the most happiness for the most people. We are also now in a position to see what Mill would have said about the hot button issues I mentioned at the top of this lecture the legalization of marijuana, gay marriage, and inflammatory speech. Should pot be legal? Absolutely, Mill would say. By using pot, you can only harm yourself. Of course, you might injure someone else if you say drive while under the influence, but this is no reason to make pot illegal. Just like with alcohol, it's a reason to legally restrict driving while under the influence. And we'd want to keep it out of the hands of minors as well, but this is no different from tobacco. Age restrictions would simply be mandated. But if you, an adult, want to smoke some pot or put some in a brownie, Mill would say, go for it. Should gay marriage be legal? Once again, it seems that if Mill were alive today, he'd say yes. It's hard to see how another person's marriage, gay or straight, could harm me in any definite way. Of course, I might be offended by a gay marriage, but for Mill, that's no reason to make it illegal any more than it would be to make public displays of affection illegal. And not only should it be left to each individual to determine what makes them most happy, but laws restricting marriage would seem to produce the exact kind of conformity and social stagnation that Mill was worried about. Now, 
One might argue, if gay marriage is legal, what's to stop polygamy or polyandry from becoming legal? This is a common fallacious slippery slope argument used against gay marriage uh, that was also used against interracial marriage, by the way. But Mill has a very straightforward answer. What's to stop such things? The harm principle. We should not allow polygamy or polyandry since it harms others. For example, in the past, polygamy has often involved over older men taking advantage of young teenage girls. But what about polygamy between consenting adults? That doesn't harm anyone. What's to stop that from becoming legal? Well, if you really think it's harmless, Mill would say, then why do you think it should be illegal? Don't confuse what you don't like or what you wouldn't do with what should be restricted by law. So what about freedom of speech? Mill actually had quite a lot to say about that. Long story short, Mill argued that freedom of opinion and speech should be protected because of its utilitarian benefits. Only a society that protects freedom of speech can ensure the greatest good for the greatest number. Why? Well, let's tell the whole story. For any opinion, there are only three options, Mill says. Either it's completely right, it's partially right, or it's completely wrong. Now, in the first two instances, clearly society is better off by letting that opinion be expressed. Hearing and considering something that is true or partially true helps society move closer to the truth. But when, even when an opinion is completely wrong, Mill says, society is better off when it's expressed. Why? Because its expression forces those who know better to defend the truth. According to Mill, passing laws that restrict the expression of false opinion only threatens to make the truth a dead dogma instead of the living truth it should be. If challenging the truth is not allowed, those who hold it will forget the reason it's true. People will come to hold it not because of the good evidence and arguments behind it, but simply because they're forced to. Consequently, people eventually won't even know why it's true and may not even really believe it anymore. To allow the truth to be challenged forces us to constantly justify it and thus to remind ourselves of why it's true. This means that racist speech, hurtful speech, offensive speech, hate speech, and extremist speech must all be tolerated, if for no other reason than the opportunity it provides to prove how clearly false it is. It doesn't mean that such speech is moral, but it should be legal. This leads to an interesting question. What about speech that can do harm to others? Say, for example, the classic yelling fire in a crowded building when there actually is no fire, or inciting people to riot. Mill would say that these things do directly lead to harm, and so there is good reason to restrict them. After all, it's not like such things express an opinion that could move us towards the truth. But let's bring this a little bit closer to home. What about terrorists calling people to jihad and to carry out attacks on civilian targets? Clearly, Mill would agree that such acts of violence should be outlawed. They harm others. But what about speech that encourages others to perform such actions? This is a bit dicey. I'm not 100% sure what Mill would say. I think he would allow statements like, the West is the great Satan and all Westerners deserve to die. This is an expression of opinion, the refutation of which can remind us of what is true. But calls to kill Westerners are not an expression of opinion, an opinion. They're a command to harm others. As such, I think Mill would say they should be restricted, just like inciting people to riot should be restricted. On the flip side, what about people who participate in offensive speech or expression, knowing that it will incite such violence because it offends people? Like the cartoonist from the French magazine Charlie Hebdo, who intentionally drew Muhammad, knowing that it could incite jihadists to violence and who did it again even after 10 of their staff members and two policemen were murdered by jihadists in January 2015. What would Mill say about that? I think it depends. 
if you're doing it merely for the purpose of inflicting them or inciting them to violence, then Mill would probably say no. That's too much like simply inciting a riot. But if you have other purposes in mind, then if it's not, and even if it's not to be offensive or even if it is to be offensive, then it's not your fault if others react violently, even if others have already threatened to react violently to such offenses. After all, giving in to such violent threats will only show that they work and encourage more. Soon, freedom of speech would be gone, it would just disappear. But of course, it would be impossible to enforce a law based on people's intentions. Like, were you really trying to incite people to violence or not? So Mill would likely say that offensive expression, whether it's in speech or art, should be legally and socially tolerated, regardless of violent reactions, regardless of whether people have already threatened violent reactions. It may not be moral, but it should be legal. But this raises another interesting problem. What about speech against freedom of speech? Should that be tolerated? Again, for Mill, I think the answer is yes, if for no other reason than the opportunity it provides to refute such speech. Now, efforts to actually restrict speech, say, by physically forcing someone to be quiet, that should not be tolerated. Freedom of speech must be ensured. But so too must the right to speak against freedom of speech be ensured. But why might someone speak against freedom of speech? Well, for some, of course, it's just a matter of personal bias. They don't want others to have the freedom to mock them. In fact, often many confuse freedom of speech with freedom from criticism. They think someone criticizing what they said constitutes a violation of their freedom of speech. It does not. Their opponent has just as much right to criticize their view as they do to say it. And this is true even when someone is punished for what they say, not legally punished, but punished in some other way. Freedom of speech entails that you can say what you want without legal consequences, but not without any consequences at all. Take, for example, when NBC dropped Donald Trump after he said that Mexican immigrants were rapists. Only if NBC demanded that, Do that Donald Trump be fined by the government or thrown in jail would they be suggesting a violation of his right to freedom of speech. But others object to unrestricted freedom of speech simply because, in practice, it doesn't seem to have the utilitarian benefits that Mill supposed. In a way, Mill's suggestion that free and open debate, it's kind of like he thinks free and open debate is like the process of purifying precious metals. The heat of an open debate exposes bad arguments and false opinions so they can be skimmed off, leaving us only with the good arguments and the truth. But things don't really work like this, do they? The most obvious examples of free speech and open debate appears in Congress, yet members of Congress rarely change their minds because of arguments. They just vote along party lines for whatever is in the best political interest of their own. And even when they do change their minds, it's either because of emotion or because the political tide has shifted. For example, solid arguments against displaying the Confederate flag at the South Carolina Capitol have been around since it was erected there in 1961 in protest of anti-segregation laws. But it wasn't until nine were killed at a black church in Charleston by someone who celebrated the Confederate flag that the majority of those in the South Carolina government suddenly found those arguments persuasive. Let's be honest. When was the last time an open debate changed your mind? When was the last time you saw someone else admit that they were wrong because of an argument they couldn't refute? You probably can't remember, and this shouldn't be too surprising. As we've discussed, most people aren't even interested in learning the truth. They're simply interested in reinforcing what they already believe. So they let their own biases determine which arguments they think are good and which conclusions they accept. And even if they are interested in learning the truth, a free and open debate is not going to reveal it to them unless they can distinguish good arguments from bad, unless they can identify logical fallacies and have an understanding of relevant facts unless they take special cares and not to let their own biases and preconceptions influence their evaluation of the arguments. 
but most people don't know or do any of this. Unless it's a debate among experts, where arguments are in peer-reviewed journals and everyone is up on the latest facts and people have a vested interest in believing what is true, open debate just doesn't seem to have the effect that Mill thought it did. In fact, open debate often has the opposite effect. In a 2010 article from the Boston Globe entitled How Facts Backfire, Joe Cohane summarized the scientific research on this topic. It showed that when misinformed people are presented with correct information on a topic, they not only won't change their minds, they become more entrenched, even more convinced that they were right in the first place. We not only are more apt to only seek out evidence that confirms our beliefs, but we will actively ignore contradicting evidence even though it's right in front of our faces. And it gets worse. Open public debate can even derail progress toward the truth made by specialized open debate that does work. This is why popular science took down the comment section on most of their articles in 2013. Studies showed that the open, uninformed debates that were happening below their articles were causing people to be misinformed. They could actually undo any science communication that happened as a result of people reading the original article. In a truly open public debate, it seems, the impurities don't float to the surface for all to see so that they can be skimmed off. Instead, the loudest crank demands the most attention and ends up leading everyone astray. So, does this mean that, that this, there should be limits on liberty? Specifically, liberty of speech. That speech should not be as free as Mill suggested. Not necessarily. Even if open debate doesn't reveal the truth and, lead the, and doesn't lead to progress and happiness as readily as Mill supposed, it probably still does that better than the alternative of legally restricting free speech and outlawing opinions. His worries about the truth becoming a dead dogma are still likely a greater concern. We just shouldn't fool ourselves about how easy open debate progresses us toward the truth. Now, given what we have learned about him, you might think that Mill was a big fan of Adam Smith because of Smith's suggestion that freedom in the market guarantees positive utilitarian results, universal opulence. You might even think that Mill is just expanding Smith's arguments to freedom of speech and action. But, as a utilitarian, Mill would defend the free market only if it guaranteed the most happiness. But in general, it seems that Mill thought the real-world economic system was far too complicated to make any such pronouncements. In fact, in his later years, and this is something I learned from Lawrence Cahoon's course on political philosophy, which I highly recommend, Mill claimed to be a socialist, which would make him much more like Marx than Smith. Now, how could he do this without contradicting his arguments and on liberty? Well, let's think about it. For Mill, preventing harm to others is the primary motivation for passing laws. But we live in an interconnected society. So almost anything we do affects others and thus might be thought to risk harm to others in some way, especially in the economic realm. Mill certainly would be in favor of market regulations that would prevent risky banking investments that could crash the economy. After all, people's political freedom to live their life as they see fit is of little use to them if they don't have the means to live their life as they see fit. But Mill thought the free market had given many people the freedom to harm others in exactly this way. He was especially critical of London's non-working class, who used their inherited wealth mainly to make their own lives easier without benefiting the lower classes. Free market capitalism, he thought, had solved the problem of production with the division of labor, but not the problem of distribution. Indeed, he saw many of the same injustices that Marx did. They lived at roughly the same time. The gap between the rich and poor was simply too large. A more equal distribution of wealth would have huge utilitarian benefits. So Mill liked it. Inheritance taxes were needed to redistribute wealth. Mill was particularly fond of using such monies for pensions to benefit public education and the elderly. 
But this raises an interesting question. Unequal distribution of wealth was not just a problem in the 1800s. It's a modern problem as well. According to a comprehensive study conducted at Ox by, by Oxfam, in 2014 in the US, a mere 10% of the population had 75% of the nation's wealth. Compare that to 54% in the UK. The top 1% control 40% of America's wealth. Worldwide, the problem's even worse. The top 1% have 48% of the world's wealth, and that number will likely go above 50% in 2016. Right now, the world's 80 wealthiest people own as much as the poorest half of the world's population combined. Now, clearly, Mill would not have liked this. He would have called for redistribution. But Mill was only concerned about utility, the greatest good for the greatest number. There may be other things to consider here. Does it violate someone's rights to take money they earned and give it to someone who didn't earn it? Is that fair or just? On the other hand, is it fair to have such an unequal distribution of wealth? Is it just to have half the world starving and just a few people living in luxury? Next, we'll consider what exactly a fair and just society might look like and whether such a thing is even possible.